uh, no particular order. Uh, the following I'm going to present uh, for about 15 minutes, 15 minutes or so, come Zangalita. <laughs> Langazita. <laughs> Langazita. <laughs> We're also supposed to have Comrade Tuboko. Tuboko Padu. He might join us and all he's held up with some other things. We also Comrade Fiona Tragena to present. But before we ask them to present comments, we, I think, uh, just be <clears throat> to observe a moment of silence for, well, to date all the victims of, uh, not victims, all the fatalities of COVID-19 in our country. <clears throat> And also for the former treasurer of COSA, Comrade Ronald Mufuking, but also the district secretary of Brian Panting in Cape Town, who was senselessly killed uh, uh, with uh, his daughter a couple of days ago. So if you will, just a moment of silence, girls. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, comrades. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Yeah, and I'm not sure who's ready to start uh, between uh, comrades uh, Langa, and Comrade Fiona. I mean, both of them don't need introductions. Uh, I mean, I think uh, uh, former Central Committee members themselves. Comrade Langa was also uh, a functionary of the party, full-time functionary of the party, and a head officer of the, of the party some years ago. Uh, Comrade Fiona, uh, a former student activist and uh, uh, well, an all round cadre. <clears throat> Comrade Langa will present on capital accumulation, social repro reproduction, and social protection after COVID 19. Comrade Fiona will present on the, the political economy of post COVID-19 reconstruction. So I'm not sure who's ready to present. Uh, whoever was ready to present for about 15 minutes or so. And then, and then when we wrap up, we can take a few uh, points of clarity, questions and other things. So over to you, Comrade. Fiona. Who's ready to go? Comrade Langa okay, I think we would agree that uh, Gambu go first. Okay. All right, Gambu. Uh, thank you, comrades. Uh, uh, am I audible, Comrade Chair? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, comrades. Uh, let me take this opportunity to thank the party leadership, sort of use the word leadership, word leadership of the party, uh, for inviting <laughs> uh, me to, to, to make a, a, a contribution uh, on this very important question. Uh, we are all going through a very tough time as a country, as the world, uh, fighting an invisible enemy uh, called COVID-19. It's a, it's a tough period for us but it is, it is also an opportunity post-COVID to, 
to rethink the project of development and to uh, find ways in which we could put ourselves on a better platform as a country and hopefully influence how things develop elsewhere in the world. I would also like to take this opportunity to, to appreciate the role of Comrade Jack Simon uh, uh, on, on the work that he did and, he, and his partner in the, uh, in the work of the party over decades. Um, uh, we are where we are because of sterling work of, of, uh, of, of revolutionaries like him who started in the party in the, in the 20s. We sometimes forget that. And all the way till the unbending of the, of the party, those who were able to work with him uh, must account themselves as having been privileged. Now, the title, comrades, of, of the paper I'll be sharing is Capital Accumulation social reproduction and social protection after the COVID-19 pandemic. The South African Communist Party has in recent public pronouncements argued that the country should not go back to the society we had before the COVID-19 pandemic. Whilst we would love to go back to a life without the pandemic, we certainly would not want to associate ourselves with every aspect of the socioeconomic life before it. Before the pandemic, the country was downgraded by the rating agencies, and there were serious problems with state-owned enterprises. Unemployment was about 35% in terms of its broad definition. We were the most unequal society in the planet. Certain men in our society were routinely oppressing and killing women and abusing children. We had high levels of poverty, with an economy unable to reach the significant levels, of course. Our energy regime is neither clean nor popular controlled. The crisis of capitalist reproduction. In a nutshell, we exhibited all the fault lines of an economy of an underdeveloped country. What causes underdevelopment? Underdevelopment in the main is a function of the form of integration of an economy in the global economic system. Those of us who are integrated to the form of colonialism have found their socioeconomic system subject to an external logic and not to that of the people of the country, but to that of the needs of the global capitalist system. Apartheid colonialism did not, did not end this subjection. Instead, it gave a racial dimension to it. In other words, the existence of an internal colonialism or a colonialism of a special type did not change the location of the South African socio-economic formation from its role as the supplier of primary mineral products to the global economy. Instead, in the context of the existing of, a, of, the, of the existing colonialism, colonizing historic block of white people, it created the best conditions for this historic block and this imperialist allies to optimally take advantage of an abundant cheap black labor. The current crisis of the South African colony is about the inability of the South African socio-economic formation to reproduce itself in the conditions of the absence of a cheap black labor, which now has democratic and worker rights. Today, you do not have the Group Areas Act that confined most black people to the homelands and partially exempted capital from the complete costs of the reproduction of labor. What we have is a combative working class with rights and exponentially grown black middle class and a sea of an unemployed working class with a social system that is unable to integrate them as sellers of labor power. It would be wrong to see this problem as something internal to the South African social formation only. The social formation is an effect of our country's location in the global capitalist system. South Africa's 25 years of democracy demonstrate an inability of, of addressing this reality. This reality will remain as it is as long as we don't address the conditions of our integration on this world system. The post apartheid path of development. What then has been the policy path of the post-apartheid state? The reconstruction, 
program. The reconstruction and development program marked a shift from the constitutional guidelines that the ANC had adopted in the late 80s. The constitutional guidelines was the last document of the ANC that was consistent with the historic national democratic conceptual framework, allocating as it did a prominent if shared role for the state in the political economy of a post-apartheid South Africa. True to, its true, true to its origins for the trade union movement, the RTP brought a conceptual framework that sought to reconcile popular and working class aspirations to a particular form of capitalist organization, a regime of accumulation. It is a debate for another day as to where this new frame of understanding ultimately led. Safe to say that it presented the capitalist framework as the ultimate framework from whence the demands of the popular classes would have to be canvassed and ultimately won. This would be the case even if the slogan, growth through redistribution, appeared to be and indeed was progressive. It would, be not, it would not be difficult from this standpoint to see transformation as a matter of macro and microeconomics. The lasting contribution and the sterling lectures of the RTP was this, was this contribution to what would be in quotes, a social democratic movement of the movement. I would like to ask about the delivery of basic needs, free housing for the poor, free education at primary, secondary, and tertiary level, the child and old age grants, free and publicly provided healthcare are lacquers of the reconstruction and development program. They also coincide quite well with policy perspectives contained within the agency's right to govern policy document. Notwithstanding many challenges we have met, debates and differences, this historical attempt at inclusion is the most serious accomplishment of the ANC and its allies after 25 years of democratic rule. It is the defining contribution of the presidents of Mandela and Beke. It is something we should proclaim, claim, and defend. The failure to develop a post-periphery path of development. Despite these monumental achievements, we however have not been able to craft a path that transcends our location in the periphery of the global economic system, which reproduces the ills that afflict our society. In some ways, one can define our challenge as that of the, exist of the coexistence of an ascendant social wage and the imperatives of a sustainable and transformed regime of capital accumulation. In other words, we have a promising social wage regime alongside a capital accumulation regime that is uncompetitive, which is which, if unaddressed, will stand and impel the fortunes of the South African revolution. What explains this difficulty? There may well be other reasons, comrades. But I think the most critical fact that limited the capacity of the, of the ANC to develop a post-periphery strategy was the fall of Eastern European socialism and the rise and dominance of neoliberalism. The consensus of the global elites and their representatives was to ban the state from the economy and to punish and bully those that thought otherwise. This was not made easy by the rise of digitization and the micro, and, and the micro electronic revolution. I do not want to look at the implication of microelectronics and this recompositing of the labor process. I merely want to look at its relationship with finance and this technical enabling of the financialization of the world economy. This created the space of the rise of financial instruments that led money to chase money without the mediation of production, facilitating the profiteering through finance at odds with the production of material goods. The neoliberal ethos championed by, by the most powerful fractions of global finance proscribed the space for maneuverability by the democratic state, limiting the process, the prospect of the rise of a post-peripheral economic strategy. Some theoretical questions. Part of the challenges we had was the conversion of conceptual categories whose some effect has been to subject the entire social formation to a logic that are not in the interest of most classes 
and the reconstituted historic block of the new nation that is all South Africans across class and racial lands. I argue here that part of the problem we've had is the conflation of what I call conceptual categories. And I'm going to go into the details of what these conceptual categories are, which have badly affected all of us, even though unequal. I argue that the fate of our economy affects all South Africans, maybe with the limited exception of finance capital, but all South Africans across classes are badly affected by our location as the primary producer of raw materials. I spent some a little bit of time with this. Our post-apartheid path of development has had many positive dimensions, but imminently will not address the economic interests of all classes and peoples of our country. Other than the interests of finance capital, dominant sections of business have not been positioned in a way that enables them to compete globally, particularly with regards to manufactured goods. Therefore, the economic strategy we have adopted addresses the inequalities and inequalities within the South African Social Economic Commission. This is what Black Economic Empowerment does. It, however, does not address the capabilities of the economic formation to hold its own in the globalist, global capitalist world, which is the only yardstick for a successful and sustainable developmental state. This conceptual conflation is most evident in the optics related to the concept of a developmental state. A developmental state is a state that is involved in the reconstitution of the economic structure of a peripheral economy, enabling it to positively participate in the global economy. It seeks to redefine this relationship in such a way that the path of development is defined and optimizes the interest of the peripheral society against those of the center and the dominant players of the global economy. A related question is on the ideological character of the developmental state. Is it progressive? Is it capitalist or is it both? With the exception of Cuba and the Soviet Union, Development states have been at the service of the building of a capitalist economy. This has been the case whether with the French and German states in the 19th century, trying to catch up with England, and the Chinese experiment, particularly after Deng. In a perverted and racist sense, even the apartheid state was developmental in its elaboration of state-owned enterprises, its agenda to build African capital, and its attempt to solve the poor white problem. However, its limited project was local and not global. Another conceptual difficulty in our country has been the conflation of the outcomes of a developmental state and the definition of a developmental state. Historically, developmental states have led to the well being of the majority of citizens where they have been successfully implemented. These outcomes, however, do not define a developmental state. Well-run countries with well-targeted fiscals can achieve welfare outcomes. This does not make them developmental states. Developmental states are only about the transformation of the structure of a peripheral economy into a developed economy using the instruments at the hands of the state. Such instruments include, in particular, promoting the manufacturing capacity of the state, driving the export of manufactured products, advancing import substitution, pivoting these activities as the, gen as the dominant generator of value in the economy. Let me say this again. Such instruments include in particular promoting the manufacturing capacity of the state, driving the export of manufactured goods, advancing import substitution, pivoting these activities as the dominant generator of value in the economy. What is not in dispute, comrades, is that despite the ideological affinities of those who led and established developmental states, successfully implemented developmental states have led to structural change and social inclusion. It is this outcome that imbued developmental states with their progressive credentials. This theoretical detail is necessitated by the fact that except black sections of, cap black sections of capital, dominant capital in South Africa has not come across as supportive to the building of a developmental state even if they have not publicly opposed it. Adding to this timid, timid of dominant capital to the idea of a developmental state is the fact that the liberation movement's definition of the developmental state 
is not clear. It includes both outcomes and instruments. Secondly, we have downright refused to build an institutional architecture that elaborates how the state interfaces, supports, and cajoles different sectors of capital to achieve the economic efficiencies and outcomes historically associated with successful developmental states. Reconciling the achievements of the social weight and the imperatives of a developmental state. As we have alluded previously, some of the achievements in social transformation make South Africa a point of reference. Studies have shown that without the child support grant and the, age, and the old age grant, many families would have been destitute. Our social transformation program is fundamental to the social reproduction of our society. This is what we need to, def this is what we need to defend, consolidate, and refine. Three recent developments point to the fact that the importance of this social foundation is something that is shared by most South Africans. The recent improvements of these grants as a cushion during the pandemic through increasing their value and the 350 rents grant to the unemployed attest to this. Of course, these measures were time bound and are linked to the period of the pandemic. However, the 350 rents to the unemployed has seeds of revolutionary reform. This radical potential was taken a step further when the ANCMC took the decision to look at the possibility of a basic income grant. In its words, having noted, I quote, the deep impact of inequality and poverty, despite progress made, continues to be reflected in millions of people facing hunger, living in informal settlements, in indigenous households, and unemployed. We introduced social measures to mitigate the impact of the pandemic, such as food relief, increasing grants, and the special COVID-19 grant. Although these measures may made a difference, given the devastating economic impact expected as the pandemic unfolds, we must look at additional measures to broaden the social safety net and provide for the dignity of all South Africans. The NCC therefore tasked the Social Transformation Committee and the Economic Transformation Committee to urgently meet to look at the feasibility and detailed modality of a basic income grant, including the costing and financing of this measure, and to report to the officials in the NWC. End quote. That is African National Congress statement from its last NEC on the 27th to 28th of 2020. If implemented, this would be a development of historical proportions. It would fundamentally change the lives of millions affected not only by the COVID-19 pandemic, but of vulnerabilities and risks of living under the capitalist civilization. Some have suggested that such a grant would be 500. At 500, this is an important start, but still a start. To consolidate it and to build on it, we will have to confront and deal with our development path of the past 25 years. Before outlining the measures we may have to take in addressing this development path, it is important to further reflect on the implications of this social protection measure. First, it, collect, it correctly responds to the challenges of job creation in the country. Not only is the failure to create jobs a result of artificial allocation in the global system, it is also due to the joblessness arising out of automation itself a response to the crisis of Fordism that has been with the world since the 1973 oil, oil crisis. Secondly, it correctly addresses the challenge to some form of income security in the light of the fact that the availability, the availability of jobs, that is job security, is no longer synonymous with the existence of capitalism, both in the North and in the South. Thirdly, it gives progressive policymakers the social space to attend to the structural defects of the economy with limited comfort in the awareness that there's not a single citizen in the Republic who goes to sleep hungry. This allows policymakers to focus on the job at hand to build a dynamic, modern and efficient economy. It plays a similar role that land agrarian and agrarian reform played in the development states of Japan, South Korea, and China at earlier moments of their development states. Despite this relative social inclusion, income security in a peripheral society does not guarantee passage to a developmental state and to structural change. I think it's important to make this point. Despite this relative social inclusion, 
In terms of curating in a peripheral society, does not guarantee passage to a different state and to structural change. In fact, it is quite possible that it could lead to a debt trap if the structural features of the economy are not addressed and the economy remains in its peripheral form. It is therefore important that as we take steps to consolidate the social protection plan, we take the necessary steps to put our economy on a higher and more dynamic footing. Consolidating economic competence to reinforce social protection. Any plan that must transform the structure of our economy must have the following four pillars. The first one is trust between the state and the private sector. It is impossible to plan any strategy of an economic rebirth if alacrity and animosity is the only relationship between the state and capital. We must more than before emphasize that we share the common agenda to build the economy, to pursue capital accumulation, that is wealth creation. The second pillar is the buy-in of organized workers. This project of capital accumulation must not and should not be the should not be on the basis of the super exploitation of workers. That would be maintenance of the peripheral and apartheid model. Workers' rights to organize and the right to strike must be sacrosanct as we explore this alternative path of economic development. Thirdly, this initiative should enable the voice of entrepreneurs to come through. It therefore should not address business in general, but would particularly attend to specific challenges of business in a particular sector. Whilst we should not maintain we should maintain, whilst we should maintain tripartite structures such as netlag, this plan issues from a different geography. It moves from central national entities and even provincial ones. It moves from central and national entities and even from provincial ones. It looks at each sector and builds not just a sectoral plan, important that as that is, but builds a sectoral and subsectoral public institutions with the willingness and competence to support each sector not only to thrive in South Africa, but to penetrate international markets and to be internationally competitive. Fourthly, in attending to these sectors and subsectors, it works with them with the intention to address three fundamental issues. The first one is access to markets. The public institution that works with a sector must know far more than the entrepreneurs in the sector, the conditions of both the domestic and global demand dimensions of that sector. It must make this market intelligence available to all the entrepreneurs who are organized participants in that sector. The second issue for the sectoral bodies to address is access to innovation. As we argued earlier, attending the structural issue for subordination into global political economy means changing the character and terms of our participation in it. In the heart of it, it is the necessity to move away from being a mere supplier of raw primary products into the world economy. To compete with companies in the North with their big research budgets, we have to find a way to be the cutting edge of research and innovation. The only way our entrepreneurs can do that is if the public sector steps in to make this innovation available. It would mean that researchers working with these sectoral bodies attend global industry expos and are able to know what is selling and make this information available to players in the sector. The third task is for the sectoral institution to address the, the, the issue of access to finance. One of the challenges of, of business, particular businesses of historical disadvantaged individuals is access to finance. The democratic state may have to move away from the current system of providing general funding, that is credit funding, but to link funding to sectors. There must be funding for the auto sector, for the clothing sector, for the plastic industry, etc. And here, comrades, we're not referring to grant funding, but credit, access to credit. Okay? This funding should be made available by the state. This focus on sectors could also be the basis on engaging the private, private, the private bank sector to create a similar and corresponding framework in the allocation of credit so that they reinforce the role of, of, of public finance 
in access funding in accessing funding for specific sectors of the economy the public provision of market intelligence access to innovation and finance would in some way be this be some form of socialization of the market entrepreneurs will still be individual owners of capital and they will still be driven by self interest but the social realm the society itself in the form of these public sectoral bodies would be internalized into the operation of these companies the public would be an integral part of their ecosystem this is some form of the socialization of the market in our view it is obvious that an economy undergirded by such institutional matrix has a better chance of of participating in the global economy in a way that undoes peripheralization it would be able to ensure that south africa has a fighting chance to be a south korea in the next 2 to 3 decades if this is the correct path monetary and fiscal policy must be subordinated to this framework not what we have in south africa where monetary and fiscal policies are unlinked to a strategy of wealth creation monetary and fiscal policy must be subordinated to a wealth creation strategy not the other way around in conclusion we argued at the beginning of this paper that our country's crisis is not only internally generated the present crisis of social reproduction is a function of the mode of capital accumulation the way of creating wealth this mode of creating wealth has to do with the way the capital economy came to being in our country and how it has been shaped by south africa's location in the global division of labor the global system that we are a part of reduces us to a mere exporter of primary goods it peripheralizes us the peripheral condition is the reason the economy is stagnant and we cannot create sufficient jobs for the working class the peripheral condition is the reason the economy is stagnant and why we cannot create sufficient jobs for the working class the social wage we have built in the past 25 years has done most to protect some of the most vulnerable it must be kept protected and defended bringing in a basic income grant will strengthen the social wage it will serve as a significant protection of all the excluded and the vulnerable it simultaneously creates the social space for the progressive government to focus on building the developed state with the necessary and adequate institutions to defeat our peripheral conditions to secure more revenue to, to expand social wage and to create a people's economy and alternative and a better society and civilization thank you very much comrade <laughs> Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Comrade Langa. Um, well, just to bring to the participants' attention that um, the papers that have been delivered here, we well, as part of the work of the Jack Simons Political School, we 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 find a mechanism of distributing those. So um, we will we will uh, follow that up too. Uh, so without much ado, let me ask uh, Comrade Fiona. to go ahead. Okay. Um thanks comrade Chris. Um unlike a uh, Gambo I won't be presenting a, a paper as such but I'll be making some uh, remarks on the issue of the political economy of post covid uh, reconstruction. Um so obviously as we stand now the immediate focus is on the current uh, medical crisis in the first instance um and the economic crisis uh in in the second instance so um we need to accept that we're still in the very early stages um of this pandemic uh here in south africa um so in as much as we're talking about post covid reconstruction we are nowhere near the the post covid stage yet um we we currently in the phase of an exponential uh, rise um in in cases um almost 11000 just yesterday alone um which is obviously an underestimate because that's actually just detections it's not um um all of the new cases which are um on are not even tested for or test results are not in or whatever um and for the last few days um we've been ranked either third or fourth in the world um in terms of uh, new infections um obviously it's a bit difficult to compare between countries um they've got different testing regimes um and some are actively reducing testing but for the last couple of days um we've been behind the US and India and uh, sometimes ahead of Brazil sometimes behind Brazil 
um, in terms of uh, the new infections uh, within the, uh, the, the last day. Um, and obviously we have a much smaller population than, than any of those countries. Um, so we need to prepare ourselves for, for the rapid rise um, in, in uh, fatalities um, in, in the coming period. And that the pandemic will be with us for a while. Um, uh, medically and certainly the economic effects will be with us um, even longer. Um, in terms of those economic effects, um, I think one of the, the dangers uh, that we're facing um, is that the damage uh, to the economy will be not just a temporary shock, but a long lasting uh, structural shock uh, to the economy that can actually um, put us on a, a semi-permanently um, lower growth path, uh, lower and inferior growth path. So for, for instance, in terms of the unemployment, um, which as uh, Langa mentioned is already uh, the highest in the world, um, or one of the highest in the world, depending on how it's measured, um, what we might see here is not just a temporary increase in, in the rate of unemployment, but a structural shift, um, putting us on a, a higher rate of unemployment um, for medium to long-term uh, basis. So even during this um, immediate crisis period, in which, as I said, our, our, our immediate focus obviously has to be on, on the, the pandemic itself and the, the responses to that, um, it's imperative for us to, to think, to engage, um, and to influence more um, the shape of the economy that we want um, after COVID, because we can rest assured that um, other economic classes in society um, are not waiting for this to be over before thinking about uh, how they would like things to be, be different um, in the post-COVID period. Um, inevitably, our society and our economy will be fundamentally changed um, in many ways. Um, uh, many worse ways, perhaps some better ways, I don't know, hopefully, um, but it will be a fundamentally different kind of uh, society that, that, that we're in, um, in in future. Um, one aspect of that is that I think that the political economy of um, relationships between the state, capital, different fractions of capital, um, civil society, and the citizenry at large um, will inevitably be, be different. Um, I think that history teaches us internationally that uh, generally um, it's elites who are who emerge best from most crises, um, whether it be na uh, natural disasters, wars, or whatever. In in most cases, not all cases, um, it's it's elites who are best able to to defend and to advance um, their their own interests, um, unless there's countervailing pressure from from the organised working class. And there are exceptions to this. So, for example. Um, the introduction of the, the NHS in uh, Britain after the Second World War and so on. Um, but the point is that unless there's a countervailing political pressure, generally it's elites who are, who are best able um, to, to advance uh, their, their own interests. Um, I want to, to focus a bit on the political economy of uh, the role of the state um, in the, the current period and, and the future period. And perhaps just to start with a, a bit of a reflection on um, international experiences. Um, of the pandemic. Um, obviously, we've seen uh, a huge degree of heterogeneity in the way that, uh, that this disease has affected um, countries uh, throughout the world. Um, and it, it, the determinants of uh, why some countries have been affected more than others um, are complex. I wouldn't want to just uh, be reductionist in, in, in that sense. But it is interesting when we look at some of the countries which have succeeded um, best in, in, in managing this, uh, this pandemic um, uh, medically. Um, and China is a, is a first example to look at, um, that even though it started in China and they were uh, criticized in many ways, but when you look at the number of cases in China, um, particularly as a percentage of their population, um, it's actually minimal. Um, and the response to that has often been in terms of um, the perception of Chinese exceptionalism. Um, and there are things which are very specific uh, to uh, the state, society, political economy in China, which cannot necessarily be, be replicated elsewhere. Um, but it also doesn't mean that there's nothing that can be learned from, from the Chinese experience. And importantly, it's not only, it's not only China. If we look, for example, um, at Vietnam, I think it's a very interesting case. Um, what's interesting broadly in terms of the, the econo economy and so on, but specifically in terms of the management of the pandemic. Um, because Vietnam is a country that borders China. Um, there's a, uh, a lot of movement and 
it has a lot of the same problems that in South Africa we identify as making us vulnerable um, to the spread of the pandemic. Um, overcrowding, um, informal sector, poverty, and so on. Yet in Vietnam, even up until today, um, the total number of cases is 355 infections and zero deaths in that country. It's a huge country, it's a bigger population than ourselves, I think about double the population. Um, and it's, it's, it's not New Zealand, it's not a rich country, it's not an island. So what can we learn from a country like, uh, like Vietnam? Um, and there's other cases also in, in, in that region, um, which have different political economy, even uh, Thailand, for example, um, they've had 3,000 cases, 58 deaths only, and uh, Taiwan province of China. Uh, there are a number of, of interesting cases there. Um, on the other extreme, we see countries like uh, the US and, and uh, Brazil um, with the right wing ideological uh, 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 populist uh, leaders, which and the effects of those strategies are, are, are laid bare for, for all to see. And I think that without being mechanistic or, or reductionist about it, um, because obviously it's, it's such a, uh, there's so much complexity that goes into it. But one of the determinants, um, in my view, of a success in containing the pandemic uh, medically um, is the nature of the state. And it's not just about the size of the state, but about the nature of the state um, and the role that it plays um, in, in the society. I think the, the greater the, the, the capabilities of the state, that's a key issue, the capabilities of the state, and the credibility and popular uh, legitimacy, um, the willingness to intervene strategically and so on, um, generally the better able uh, those countries have been uh, to manage it. Um, and I think some of those same capabilities are similar sort of capabilities um, as implementing, for example, an effective industrial policy. So when we look at countries like Vietnam and so on, uh, these are the same countries which have been able to generate uh, relatively fast and inclusive growth, industrialization, and so on. And for me, it's not coincidental that they tend to be the ones which have also had the capabilities um, to, to manage this well. Um, in the case of uh, South Africa, I think, and, and linking this to, to post-COVID economic reconstruction, um, the ability of our state to successfully um, manage uh, the medical crisis um, in reality and in popular perception will also influence uh, the role of the state um, in the long term uh, in, in terms of uh, what, what uh, society accepts the state, what role it, it, society accepts the state playing um, in the economy. Um, and I remember presenting at some uh, uh, webinars probably about two months or so ago at the early stage um, and, and making an argument that uh, recognition of the, uh, the successful management of the, of the pandemic by our state um, actually placed us in an excellent uh, position um, for a broader role of the state going forward um, in the economy in terms of broader, uh, a, a more interventionist role in the economy and so on. Um, now I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> um, and I think unless, um, our state can change strategies in some ways um, and quickly uh, get a handle on um, the exponential rise um, in infections. Um, neither will history look kindly on us, um, nor will society at large um, look kindly on us uh, by, the end of this, by the end of this year. And it may uh, undermine the popular legitimacy of, of the state. I'm not even talking in terms of uh, uh, political parties and so on. I'm talking about the broad popular legitimacy of the state and the role that the state um, plays uh, in the economy. Um, let me come then to um, what could be some aspects um, um, of, uh, of economic response. And I'm not going to get into uh, nitty gritties of um, uh, specific uh, expenditure allocations uh, and so on, but more talking in terms of the political economy um, of the economic response, both immediate um, and, and, and longer term. Um, I think in the immediate uh, term, it's clear that we need a far stronger um, and much larger stimulus package. Um, what is on the table now is nowhere near um, what is actually needed to, to minimize uh, the damage uh, to the economy during this period. 
um, I think we need to recognize that economic losses during this period um, can, can easily become permanent losses. So to put it in a practical sense, um, a firm that closes as a direct result of the, of the pandemic, even when the pandemic passes, that firm doesn't automatically reopen. It's not a symmetrical, it's not like a ball that bounces back automatically. That's not how uh, markets work. Um, a worker who loses their job, even when the pandemic isn't there, it doesn't mean that they will automatically uh, get their job back. So from this perspective, there's a clear um, economic justification, and uh, not even from a Marxist perspective, just from a perspective of, of simply managing markets um, to borrow more, um, in the first instance domestically, um, to, to ensure that those losses are mitigated um, and to stimulate the economy more. And I think what we've seen so far is uh, really just a fraction, an absolute fraction um, of what is needed. Um, in terms of the, the, the post-COVID uh, reconstruction program, um, it's important for us, particularly as, as the party, I, I believe, to, to see this as a transformative uh, reconstruction program. So that it's not just a case of uh, rebuilding uh, some of the same or more of the same, um, but transforming the nature of the of the economy. Um, and uh, let me just put forward um, a couple of uh, planks of that, I think, um, and I'm, I'm sure it's uh, what comrades have already been thinking about and talking about. Um, one is that it, it, I think the opportunity is there for, for more strongly advancing the case for the NHI, because if, if we cannot win the case for an NHI, coming out of this crisis, when would we win the case for, for, for an NHR? Um, there's, there's a clear need uh, for that. And I think if we had that kind of system in place, um, already now, some of the people who have died would not have, have, have would probably still be, be with us today. Um, secondly, a, a, a state-led mass infrastructure program. Um, and here I'm talking not just about incremental uh, uh, changes and incremental building, something that's going to take uh, uh, years to put into place, but a mass infrastructure program um, that was, uh, has uh, both stimulating effects in the, in the short term um, and contributes to uh, putting us on a, um, a, a superior growth path in the medium uh, to long term. Um, I think we need uh, you know, more industrial policy interventions but geared not just, well, in the immediate term at, at uh, supporting businesses um, you, you know, almost indiscriminately, um, just trying to keep a, as many firms um, functioning and open um, as possible so that they can survive to the, uh, the post-COVID period. But in the longer term, um, industrial policy that more strongly incentivizes the kind of uh, uh, economy that we want. Um, and beyond industrial policy, um, insofar as the state is um, uh, subsidizing business, needs to particularly subsidize the kinds of uh, uh, the parts of the economy that we in particular want to prioritize and build, the green economy, the care economy, um, and so on. Um, I think there's also an opening here for, for advancing the idea of a, a wealth tax and perhaps in the short term, calling it a solidarity tax. Um, and uh, the party might uh, be well placed to take up a popular campaign around that. Um, in the, in the first case, it, it could be a, a once-off solidarity tax um, linked, to, linked directly to COVID and the idea that as a, as a, as a South African society, we all need to pull together. Um, I think that the timing is, is good for it because um, most of the elites have been relatively less affected uh, economically. Um, people have been at home. There's, there's spare cash in the bank accounts of most well-paid people. Um, and um, I think there's a, there's a clear justification for, for once of solidarity tax um, on wealth. Um, and once you kind of have that in the door, um, I think it provides an opening for, for a wealth tax on an ongoing basis. Obviously, there are complexities. There's an argument that it, it, it takes years to kind of put something like this into place. Um, but I think that um, it, at least a start can be made. So maybe just my, my, my final comment is that I think, as I said earlier, um, we don't know in what ways the nature of our society and economy will be different post COVID. We just know that it will be fundamentally different. And those outcomes um, are not cast in stone. Um, we can be sure that as we are discussing how we would like things to be different, um, uh, other class forces are having the same discussions. Um, and 
are, are seeing how can this provide them with an opportunity to get the kinds of outcomes uh, that they would like, whether it be a more flexible labor market, whether it be lower taxes, whatever. Um, and I think ultimately the, the outcomes will be determined uh, primarily by, by political balance of forces. Um, so it draws attention to the importance of, of organizing and mobilizing in support of popular demands and thinking of new ways to do that. It might not be through marches, um, during, at least in the current period, but how do we um, exert uh, the organized pressure of uh, the working class and, and progressive forces uh, more broadly um, to strengthen those kind of demands? Let me leave it there. Wherever. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Fiona. Um, and once again, uh, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, and Comrades will realize that uh, there are a whole range of ideas that are he have been put across, uh, well, both uh, Comrade Lanka and Fiona uh, have given us something to think um, broadly about. Um, at this point, what